Come on, put your hands together and let's bless the Lord in the house on this morning. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the, the Lord. It is always good to be back in the house of the Lord just one more time. And we thank God for him allowing us to be back in his house. Because it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Anybody glad to be here on this morning? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go right to the word of God. There's a word for the Lord from the Lord on this morning for his people. And it will be found in the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to read into your hearing verses 8 through 14. 2 Kings chapter 5 verses 8 through 14. Second Kings chapter five, verses eight through 14. And when you have it, someone say amen. Okay, we're gonna still try to give you some time to find it. Second Kings chapter five, verses eight through 14. Amen? If you don't mind, please rest to your feet as we read from the word of the Lord on this morning. You want me to switch to the handheld? have it? Amen. And the word of God says, and it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought, he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. This is the story of Naaman the leper, who now has an encounter with Elijah. And I want to just draw your attention to this one particular verse. I'm going to kind of preach the whole story, but... The, the heart of the message that God has for us on this morning is going to come from verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, 
according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then went he down and dipped himself in the Jordan. I want to preach this morning from, with the help of the Holy Ghost from this subject matter, plunge. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, take the plunge. He dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, and he was clean. Father, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor, and we just magnify you on this morning. Thank you for what you are about to share with your people. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your spirit that's in this place. Now, Holy Spirit, control everything in this house. So do everything that is not like you. Free us that we might be able to hear the word that God has for us on this morning. And we thank you in advance for what you are about to share with your people. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let somebody in the house say amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter 5, it begins to describe this man by the name of Naaman. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, he was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, uh, but he was a leper. It is very important as we begin to deal with the text that we glean some information from the text that is critical to us being under, able to understand the significance of what God wants to reveal to us on this morning. So when we take a look at lame, Naaman, it is important for us to understand that Naaman was a leader amongst his people. He was a person that other people followed. I wonder, am I talking to anybody in here who knows that you are a leader? That God has set you in a place or a position of leadership. And let me help you by giving you a simple definition of a leader a leader is someone who other people follow. If no one is following you, you ain't a leader. What makes you a leader is somebody has to be following you. We understand that Naaman had to be a leader because he was a captain in the Syrian army. And the Bible says that he also, or it intimates to us, that he had to be a person who was influential. One of the things about people who are in leadership position is that they hold a position of influence. They have the ability to influence other people. And he was a person who held a position of power. And not only does, was he a person who held a position of power, but the text allows us to know that he was honorable and which literally means that Naaman was also someone who had favor with his king. Are y'all ain't with me? I wonder if, again, am I talking to anybody in here that is considered to be a leader a person who holds a position of influence of power or power, or do you just know that you are one of God's favorite and you have the favor of your God? The Bible is teaching us some things about Naaman because he is a person who has the king's favor. And the reason why the king respected him or held him in favor was because Naaman was used by the Lord. 
to give victory to Syria over their enemies. Oh, y'all, I'm talking to some people in here that not only do you have the favor of God on your life, but God has used you to defeat some enemies in people's lives. You, you, you are a warrior. You are a victor. You are someone who God has used to accomplish mighty and powerful and great things. And the Bible says that he was a man of valor, which means he was a man of strength, of might, and of wealth. Now, when you put all of that together, he's a leader. He's a person of influence. He holds a position of power. He's a person who the Lord has used to defeat enemies. He has the favor of the king, the respect of the king. He is a person who is considered a man of valor. But then the Bible says something in the last clause of the verse. It says, but he was a leper. This is a contradiction that is stunning when you look at the person of Naaman's accomplishments and his status, but then you see him being classified as a person who was a leper. Because one would think that a leopard or a disease of leprosy would not be associated with someone of this stature. But yet, his favor, his strength, and his position did not disqualify nor preclude him from being infected with leprosy. Oh, y'all. Uh, or could it be that it was because of all the things that Naaman was that the disease sought him out? I'm already in the house. Because we have the opinion that unclean diseases only occur to people who live in unsanitary conditions. Are y'all with me? However, the text is teaching us that uncleanliness can happen to people who live in palaces in pristine conditions, watch this, because the disease seeks out people, not places. Oh, God, this, this is good right here because, see, sometimes we want to equate the place or the place that we are in as a guard or a safe haven from disease, or in this case, can I just help you, from sin. But sin can infiltrate any place because sin is looking for people, not places. So even when you are a person of favor, a person of respect, a person of valor, a person who has gained victory through God, you better still understand that the disease of sin can find you because the disease of sin is more interested in people than it is in places. And we better stop thinking that the only people who sin are people who are in unsanitary places because sin can find itself right in the church. You can be in a clean place, but sin can seek you out. And it's not a disease for unclean people or unsanitary places. It's a disease that anybody, even the favors of God, can catch. Because he says, I believe sometimes we think because who we are, it exempts us or precludes us or disqualifies us from certain diseases or certain sins. 
And God is letting the body of Christ know it has nothing to do with your position, the favor, the grace on your life, or anything else of magnitude or status. It has everything to do with this disease seeks out people. In fact, because of all of those things might be the very reason why sin has sought you out. Naaman has contracted, stay with me, Naaman has contracted a disease that's called leprosy that causes him to be separated or distant from other people. Among the 61 defilements of ancient Jewish laws, leprosy was second only to a dead body in seriousness. A leopard, watch this, a leopard wasn't allowed to come within six feet of any other human being. including his own family. The disease was considered so revolting that the leopard wasn't permitted to come within 150 feet of anyone when the wind was blowing. Isn't it interesting that this disease called leprosy force people to be six feet away from anybody else. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost. And, and, and this was all due, watch this, because he contracted something that then made him to be put away. So God sent me to ask you a question. What have you contracted that has caused you to be quarantined from the presence of God or put at a distance? What have you contracted? Isn't it interesting that you have to take something to you that then causes you to be put away? And God wants to know, what is it that you have contracted that has now put you in quarantine from the presence of God or put at a distance? The Syrians had gone out and brought away captives out of Israel, and one of them was a little girl who served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. In other words, what she said is that I wish that my master Naaman were with the prophet who is in Samaria, because then he would heal him of his leprosy. Watch this. She saw his condition, but she knew if he was where the prophet was, that he would recover him of his leprosy. And what is so ama amazing about the text is that when you look at this word recover, it actually means to gather in. Why is that significant? Because if leprosy causes you to be put away. Only you being recovered can allow you to be gathered back in. In word of her saying, got told to the king, and since the king has such 
favor and respect for Naaman, he wanted him to be healed or he wanted him to be gathered back in. So the king sent a letter to Joram, the, the son of Ahab, which with, with, he sent with him silver and changes of raiment so that Naaman could be recovered from his leprosy. But when Joram read the letter, he rent his clothes in shock and outrage at the request because he was asking him to do something that only God could do. The king of Syria sent a letter to the king of Israel and said, I want you to heal my servant Naaman of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, the Bible says he rent his clothes in, in shock because the king of Syria was asking him to do something that only God can do. Can I come down your street for just a second? What God wants you to understand, there ain't but one person that can recover you from the effects of sin. And that is God himself. No man can do it. Y'all ain't hearing me. The only person that can do it is God himself. And what you need done, somebody say only God can do. So Joraham thought the letter was a setup for the Syrians to do battle with him because they were asking him to do something outside of his capabilities. But Elijah heard that the king had rent his clothes. And so Elijah sent word to, to the king to tell him to send Naaman to him so that Naaman might know that there's a true prophet in Israel. I wonder, are there any true prophets in the world today? Are there anybody in the world that is really saying that all that they are is a mouthpiece of God? That they can use, be used by God to do what only God can do? He says, if you need some help, Mr. King, send this man to me so that he might know that there is a true prophet in Israel. Why? Did Elijah say that there is a prophet in Israel? Because if you know anything about Ahab or Joraham, they worship idol gods. And there were false prophets all around in Israel. But how many of you all know that a false prophet can't heal you of sin because they don't have the power that it takes in order to help you in the way that you need to be helped? You got to find somebody who God has called to do what only God can do. And the problem is we are running to the wrong people trying to seek help from the wrong people and everybody can't help you because everybody ain't quite qualified by God because they are not a true prophet. I wish I had somebody in here that would give God a praise for the true prophets of his kingdom. He says there is a true prophet because there's some false prophets, but there is a true prophet in Israel, so have him to come to me. So Naaman comes to Elijah's house and he stares at Elijah's door can't you see him walking up to the house of the man of God, the prophet of God? And as he stands at his door, watch this. Elijah doesn't move. He doesn't even go out to see Naaman. He sends a messenger. And he says, go tell Naaman that he needs to go to the Jordan and wash seven times and his flesh shall come again unto him and he will be clean. Now this word clean means to become morally pure because while you are immorally pure or unrighteous, you will not be accepted back in. I wonder if I'm just talking to people who don't realize 
that you've been quarantined. Because you don't realize that you've contracted something that has put you away or at a distance from God. And he's literally saying to you, you will not be brought back in until you are clean. Which means you have to be morally purified. And you must live a righteous life. Because God will not accept sin or unrighteousness in his presence. He says to Naaman, here's what you need to do. You need to go and wash seven times in the Jordan so that you can be gathered back in. I'm almost done. Y'all don't even know it. But Naaman went away angry with Elijah. Why? Because Elijah did not come out to see him in person and then stand before him and call on God and wave his hand over his leprosy so that he might be healed. Naaman had an expectation that once he got to Elijah, that Elijah would literally come out of his house, walk up to Naaman, stand before Naaman, and call on the name of the mighty. Oh, y'all don't. See, we have an expectation of how we want God to deal with us. And a lot of times we want God to deal with us with somatics and with drama and with charisma. And we have this idea that God is just going to call us down to the altar. And somebody is going to stand before us and cry out to God, oh God, in the name of Jesus, and lay hands on you. And then all of a sudden, you're going to be healed from whatever it is that you need to be healed from. And Naaman, oh, y'all don't want me to come down. Naaman is just like you finicky Christians who think that there's only one way that God can move in your life. And he comes to Elijah's house. And his expectation was Elijah would come out and call on God and wave his hands and he would be healed. And then he has the audacity to say, are there not two rivers in Damascus who are greater than the rivers of Israel? I don't want to wash in the Jordan. The Jordan is a dirty river. If I'm going to wash in something, let me wash in something that is clean, something that I know about. So he walks away from Elijah angry. The Bible says that he was wroth because Elijah did not do what he expected from Elijah. Can I help somebody? Naaman was offended. Somebody help me real quick. Look at your neighbor in the Holy Ghost and say, neighbor, do you have the spirit of offense? Uh, y'all, uh, he, he was offended. Watch this. Watch this. Why was Naaman offended? Because Elijah did not treat him as someone who deserved to be treated in regards to his status and favor with the king. Can you not see Naaman having a conversation with himself saying, Elijah must not know who I am. I'm the captain of the Syrian host. God has used me to bring victory to Syria. I'm a person of favor and status. How dare you treat me 
like I'm a nobody. You ought to come out to me instead of sending me a messenger. You ought to stand before me and call on your God because do you not know who I am? And the problem with the body of Christ is we got too many people who think that their positions and their status and the favor of God that's on your life that people owe you something because of who you are. And when they don't treat you the way you think you ought to be treated, you get offended. You even get offended with God because God should know who you are. Naaman is offended. But can I help somebody? When you are in need of a miracle, you need to leave your offenses behind. Why? Watch this. Listen to what the Holy Ghost said. Because your miracle isn't concerned with your status, but with your disease. You think the anointing of God is concerned with your status? The anointing is concerned with the disease. It has been sent to help you. It don't care about your status. It cares about your situation. It cares about what needs to be broken off your life. You better learn how to humble yourself before the almighty God and say to God, no matter who I think I am, I stand in the need. Of some help. Because the anointing ain't sent to status. The anointing is sent to heal you of your disease. Watch this. When he leaves angry and wroth, one of his servants runs after him and says, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much rather than when he saith to you to wash and be clean, he, he just asked you to do something that was simple. And if you really wanted to be healed, if he told you to do something great, you would have done it. And now because he told you to do something simple, you walk away offended and angry and upset and mad. His, his servant is literally rebuking the master to his father and saying, really? He didn't ask you to do something that was so outrageous. It is very simple. Just go wash and you will be clean. So Naaman then went down to the river of Jordan. And the Bible said in verse 14, he dipped himself in it seven times. And he came out with his flesh like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. When I was studying the text, the word dip was translated to mean plunge. And then the Holy Ghost started talking to me. He said, Plunging is different than dipping. And then he had to bring to me the representation of the River Jordan. 
Because then I saw a body of water. And he says, son, my water or water represents my word. So what, in essence, I told Naaman to do was go plunge in the word of God. Until it completes your transformation. Watch this. He said, tell my people, don't skim the surface of the water. Because too many times when it comes to the word of God, we like to skim the surface. He says, when you skim the surface, it doesn't have the power to complete the transformation because you didn't get all yourself in it. All you're doing is skimming the surface. But when you take a plunge, tell somebody in order to plunge, you got to go in head first. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. What I then saw was people jumping head first into a body of water. And then the Holy Ghost said, I need for people to take a plunge into the word of God. And I need them to go in head first because the thing that I need to change is their mind. Their mind has to be renewed. The problem with the, pro the body of Christ, you don't dip your toe in the word of God, expecting the skimming of your toe to change your situation. God said it ain't so. If you want to be changed, you got to take a plunge and you got to plunge head first right into the world. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, take the plunge. See, sis, what I've come to tell you that your problem isn't going to be solved until you take the plunge into what? The word of God. Somebody say, not church, not church. Not religion, not religion. But into the what? Into the what? Into the what? Somebody say, go ahead first. Because you need to be renewed by your mind. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. God don't want your feet. He wants your mind. He wants your head. And you got to be willing to go in head first. But pastor, I'm afraid that I can't swim. I hear the Lord saying, don't worry about it. Just take the plunge and I got you. You won't drown. You won't die. I've got angels all around me that's going to help you. You just need to take the plunge. Somebody slap fire with somebody in the Holy Ghost and say, take the plunge. But watch this, watch this, watch this. Because then the Holy Ghost said, you can't plunge into a puddle. I said, go ahead, God. He said, see, the problem with my people is they're trying to take a plunge in water that ain't deep enough. You're sitting around listening to people teach and listening to the people preach, but they ain't giving you nothing but a surface word, an elementary word. God said, that ain't going to cut it, not with the spirit of leprosy that's on your life. You need to be able to take a plunge into the deep word of God, deep crying out to deep is the word deep enough is there some meat in the word or are you sucking on milk to 
Because milk ain't deep enough for you to plunge in. You need a deep word. Somebody tell your neighbor, you need a deep word. Not a surface word. Not a shallow word. But a deep, revelatory, power pack, true, uncompromised, unadulterated word of God from a true prophet. Somebody that has spent time in the presence of the Lord. Do I have somebody that want a deep word? He said, tell my people, you can't plunge in a puddle. Because if you do, you're going to break your neck. You, you can't plunge into something that's shallow. Because if you do, you're going to get hurt. But if you plunge into the deep word of God, it will change your life. Can I go a little bit further? Again, the Lord was talking to me last night while I was outside running. He said to me, he said, Pat David, tell my people that the Jordan represents a place of transformation and transition. I feel like I hear the Lord saying, if you've been wondering why you feel like you're stuck and you ain't going nowhere, he says it's because you haven't taken a plunge into the Jordan, into the deep word of God. Because when you plunge into the word of God or into the Jordan, not only is it a place of transformation, it is also a, it's also a place of transition. And the reason why you have not transitioned is because you're skimming the surface. I said to God, now hold on, because if I go back and I tell him what you told me, I'm going to need some evidence to back it up, because my mind began to wonder. I said, was it Jesus baptized in the river, Jordan? He said, yes, son. My son was baptized into the river of Jordan. And he said, and watch this. When he got in the river, he was the son of a carpenter. But when he came up, he was the Christ, the Messiah. You may want to follow me for a second. I said, God... You know you're preaching now. He said he went down a carpenter, but he came up the Christ, the Messiah. He said, tell my people they're going to go down as ordinary men, but they're going to come up in the newness of their ministry. I've got to, to tell somebody when you hit the water, get ready for a transformation and get ready for a transition. Is there anybody ready for God to shift you to the next level? Tell your neighbor, then take the plunge because the shifting is in the plunge. The transition is in the plunge. The transformation is in the I feel the Holy Ghost. Tell somebody, take the plunge, take the plunge. T tell somebody, take the plunge, take the plunge. Your transition is in the plunge. Your transformation is in the plunge. If you want God to gather you back in and bring you out of quarantine, then take the plunge. Into the deep 
signatory, powerful word of God that that's with your transformation in your I dare you, I dare you, in the Holy Ghost, to go ahead and take your transition, take a step, feel the shifting, say to the Lord, I'm ready to go to the next level, I'm ready to go to my next day, I'm ready to transition from an ordinary man to my purpose, my destiny, my ministry. Are you ready? Are you ready? Then take the plunge. Take the plunge. But watch this, watch this, because I'm almost done. You cannot transition until you've been transformed. See, we want to be transitioned, but we don't want to be transformed. The first thing that the Word of God is going to do in your life is to change you, to clean you. Then you can transition. But if you ain't clean, you ain't going nowhere. I got one more thing, and then I'm going to quit. Naaman, <laughs> he actually says to Elijah, what I need for you to do now is give me some, some of this dirt, some of this earth, where this is all taking place so that when I go back to my land, I can worship and build an altar from the place that I received my miracle. He takes the dirt from Israel back to Syria so that when the king has him to go into the house to worship idol gods, he can put the dirt in the house of the idols so that he can worship the God of Israel. But he needed to carry with him the place where his miracle took place. Somebody in here get me real good. Whatever God is about to do in your life, take it with you. So that you can always give him the sacrifice of what he did in your life. After this, I, I, I'm going to leave that alone. After this, Naaman then offers Elijah a blessing. He wants to give Elijah some gifts, some money, some change of clothes. And Elijah says to him, can't take it. So Naaman leaves and walks away. But old Jehazi, that's Elijah's servant, he goes and chases Naaman down. And he says to Naaman, there's some sons of the prophet who are in need of some things. So give me the silver and the clothes that you wanted to give to Elijah, give them to me so I can bless these men of God with them. Naaman has no problem with it. He gives it to Jehazi. But then, Elijah asked Jehazi, where have you been? So let me tell you something. When you're in the presence of a true prophet, God will expose your sins. Elijah never left his house. But he said to Jehazi, where is it that you've been? Do you not realize that my heart went with you? To Naaman. And then he asked him a powerful question. He says, is it time for us to receive gifts? Is this the proper time for us to be blessed for doing ministry? And then God says, say one more thing to my people, especially those who are called the prophets of my kingdom, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers, this ain't no time for you to be seeking monetary gain to do my work. Yeah. 
There is a time and a season for everything. God said, in this time, in this season, it's about my people and getting them back to me. It is not about you being rewarded. When ministry becomes about money, we have lost the heart of God. He said, it's not time for it. It's time for you to do ministry because my people need to be clean. And here you are, Jahazi, wearing about your pocket. <clears throat> do you not know that I will take care of you? It's not the time. I've come to tell somebody, be careful that you don't receive a blessing out of time. Because this is not the time to be worried about getting blessings. This is the time to be worried about God's people. I'm done. Take the plunge. What are you going to plunge into? The Word of God. And you're going to go in head first. All the way. Every part of you need to be covered by the Word of God. And you cannot plunge in a puddle. And neither does God want you skimming the surface. It is time out for this surface word that the church has been getting. Because that's why we have so many unclean people in God's house. And they can't get clean with a surface word. They've got to take the plunge into the deep word of God. Do you want to be transformed? Do you want to come out of quarantine? Do you even know that you have contracted something that has put you away from God, out of his presence? The six feet syndrome. Do you think that what we're going through is for nothing? Or do you think that the God of this world is talking to his people? It blew me away when I studied that leprosy meant that they could not get within six feet of anybody else. And now we're living in a time of social distancing where we can't be six feet from anybody else. Quarantined because we contracted something that is highly contagious. And so is sin. Sin is so contagious that if the wind is blowing, you need to be 150 feet away from somebody. But we're sitting up in church, all close together, infecting each other with our sins. And then the preacher is preaching a surface word, and you're skimming the word of God, expecting transformation and transition when the Word of God is not deep enough to do what you need done. You better get back to the Word of God and take the plunge. In Jesus' name, amen.